thank you everybody, in particular the organizers, for inviting me. Uh, so I will try and attempt to introduce you to the world of game engines and virtual reality. I mean, you've heard about it a little bit yesterday. Uh, why is it in important and interesting here? Because I think it can help to constitute some immersive tools that help us better explore and manipulate structures. So picture is better than a thousand words. So just to give you a um, preview of... Okay. What I'm going to talk about. There's these types of approaches, so you can I introduce you to Xavier, who is the main developer currently of Unity Mall. And so he's basically tried uh, all the hardware gear that he got his hands on, either these uh, headsets with some hand recognition or a device with these um, um, peripherals or the HoloLens uh, to see what would make exploration of, of microstructures easier. So, but wait, I mean, you heard all that yesterday already, right? You had a nice talk by Todd. Basically, he said it would be better to wait uh, 10 years before we look at this. So I'm going to get out of this. And then maybe some of you are longer around here, and they also knew about the work by even Sutherland that already looked in the 60s at these uh, headsets, and he already looked at molecules. So what new things am I going to tell you? So one thing that's important to keep in mind is that we have now much more computer power and that gives some possibilities in terms of structure, simulation, manipulation. The hardware is becoming much better. Uh, it has a smaller form factor. The price has dropped greatly. If you want to get a headset, you will not even need 500 pounds for it. And uh, one point I want to stress is you now have software frameworks that help you develop uh, these tools and access this hardware. Uh, and so, for some reason, I was a bit too quick. The one framework I want to introduce you to is called Unity, and it's a game engine. It's designed to build computer games. And so I want to convince you that it can also be used to do some scientific applications. So we did a software called Unity Mall that's basically a visualization software based on this game engine. Uh, why was this an interesting approach? Well, first of all, we have only a small team. And so with this approach, you build one project and then you can get executables for the different platforms, for the web and so on. And you have, of course, easy access to advanced graphics. Um, and this actually, I think, really helps uh, to bridge what I call the great divide, the great divide between, well, writing the code and then getting to an application that works, or in other words, the great divide between computer science, computer graphics, and structural biology. Uh, there is actually uh, really uh, only a slow and limited transfer between these two domains, and if you want to know more about that, it's, it's written down here in, in this paper. And so uh, my argument will be that the game engine will basically help you to bridge this divide and make it easier uh, to connect these two domains. And to convince you about this, I will tell you a little bit more about Unity Mall, give you a first primer. So the first thing is uh, it's a bit different in terms of programming than a classical approach. What you will have is a view like this, where you will actually see this is your final application. Uh, it's the same view as you would have in an executable. Then you have here a sort of internal view where you can see all that's in the system, but also the lightings, the cameras, and so on. And you have the different objects that are exposed here and all the parameters uh, um, that go with it. And then you can actually run your application in this editor, meaning I can now here change things interactively while it's running. I do not have to build, compile, and test. I'll just run it, and then I select some object. Uh, here was, was the secondary structure, and try to change some parameters directly and see what happens. So before I even write a single line of code, I can explore all that's exposed here interactively to see what makes sense, what works well, and what is interesting. And so that was a quite uh, useful, at least for us, um, uh, um, way to, to build things, because at that time we had had a traumatizing experience by coding something with OpenGL from the bottom up. And so basically we had developed a um, visualization uh, representation called Hyperballs. You can see here it's a nice way to represent, for instance, changing bonds. You can see that you, they can get thinner and thicker and you can also interpolate and represent most of the classical uh, representations. 
And so our task was simply wanted to see, could we do the same thing that we had done over a year or so, simpler and easier in a game engine, getting the same result, of course. And uh, if that hadn't worked out, I wouldn't be here. So uh, that was fine. So we could access to quite low level graphics, for instance, the shaders on the CPU, on the GPU, which we needed. And so then we continue to try to see what benefits we could uh, get from such a, such a system. So uh, here, for instance, is another example. From time to time, I teach stereochemistry. And of course, you always talk about the molecule and its, its mirror image. So in something like Unity, you can very simply take your system, even if the software hadn't uh, implemented it, and then you add a plane, you put a mirror on it, and then you have the molecule and its mirror image. So this is something basically that makes it very easy to test your ideas. If you have any things you think would be useful in visualization, but you're not a computer scientist, you haven't been trained in that, you may be uh, able to do it quite quickly if it's a simple thing uh, using such an approach. So we use it a lot for prototyping new ideas. Just to give you uh, a second example, a bit more complex than just this mirror plane, uh, with colleagues from RAS, actually they had this idea that uh, uh, you could introduce a new type of abstraction for beta sheets when your structures where beta sheets are, are quite present. They call it magic carpet. And so it's basically connecting these sheets as a, as a surface. And this was uh, quite easy to implement in, in Unity Mall. And then actually what you can do once you have these surfaces, of course, you can map some information onto them, either using the color, or for instance, you can map some textures that could show the, the direction of the, of the strands, or I mean, you can imagine other things that you could do with that. Okay, so far for prototyping. The other thing that you get for free, of course, because uh, people playing computer games, they're usually also quite into technology. So they like to look at 3D things. They like to do, uh, try out different peripherals. So you get easy access to new technology. So this is one example using augmented reality. There's a package called Buforia that has a development kit for Unity. And then it basically took a, I don't know, an hour or an afternoon to get some, some demo going using this by Buforia to add some augmented tags to, a, to an object and then display molecule with it, for instance. So it becomes quite easy actually to test out these new technologies. And so that's a little bit what I'm going to talk about. So one of the technologies is, uh, for instance, augmented reality. This is a HoloLens, uh, which is basically a very big, uh, glass and then it overlays some a structure onto what you're seeing. So you would see, you can see a molecule floating in the room. And uh, uh, again, there's a development kit for Unity. And so it's relatively straightforward to, to add uh, uh, this to an existing software that you already had. So we had a HoloLens version relatively quickly. Then there, it's a bit more tricky in that case because actually the HoloLens, it runs the visualization on the, the on the device. So it's a very small embedded processor only and it's very slow. So what you just saw is a ribosome. It's not so small and uh, out of the box, it would not run on the HoloLens actually. There was some work needed to go from the original uh, surface that was about a 3 million vertex mesh to a trimmed down version, uh, about 600,000 vertices that more or less looks quite similar than the original. So the point here is if you want to get performance out of this game engine, then it might become a bit more complex because you need to understand how the game engine works and what you need to tweak to get better performance. But if you're just prototyping, then that's not needed. So let me give a brief summary on pros and cons of these game engines. Uh, I think there clearly is a shortened development cycle. Uh, you have a relatively low learning curve. You have also the hardware support I already mentioned. It's for at least for small teams quite cost and time efficient and pretty flexible in the, in the ways of things you can do. Then, as I just mentioned, it might be tough if you need good performance, strong performance. Uh, um, in our case, at least it's a commercial game engine. So whatever they choose as development, it's of course imposed and we have to live with it and try to adapt the code. And um, also the popularity of the game engine give, makes a difference because if you have a very popular game engine, you find a lot of example codes on the internet, you get a lot of help from, from the community. Whether if you choose a very only narrow, little known tool, then it might be more difficult to, to get proficient with it. Okay, 
And then my last point, that's really what I want to try to focus on today, is uh, what I call immersion. Uh, I both mean immersion in a three-dimensional sense into the structures of molecules, so viewing in three dimensions and being able to apprehend the spatial architectures of these objects, but also immersion in the sense of being an actor uh, of what you look at and being able to manipulate the molecules or more generally the data. So maybe some of you know the folded game, which is a sort of 3D puzzle to fold proteins. So that's a bit what I mean with manipulation. And so in the lab, we actually build a sort of arcade and with that we can go to schools and then we ask the children to try and either unfold or refold some small RNA or DNA fragments. And that's really what I mean by manipulating these objects. Of course, there is some physical engine running so that they do not do too many stupid things to the molecules. But uh, still, it's quite uh, uh, interesting to see how these objects react to, to, to our deformations, for instance. Okay. So once you've got all this in place, I think the first thing you probably want to do quite na naturally is a visual exploration of these objects. Is this uh, immersive visualization good for, for visual exploration? And so here you have a, a, a capture of a, of a session with Unity Mall VR. So you can see you can manipulate these uh, objects with these uh, game engine peripherals. And then what we did in a very simple way, because we wanted to have the same menu as in a desktop version, we just projected it on a, on a pole that you can see to the left here from time to time. And then we have a sort of laser pointer metaphor where you can just activate a, a button. This is ergonomically not at all the best way to do it, but it's just we didn't want to spend time on developing a user interface at this point. And uh, yeah, then you can... Um, look at, at, at these uh, objects. And so uh, we did not do this completely just for fun or just for you know, exploring things. We actually had a collaboration with a pharmaceutical company, uh, UCB Biopharma. And uh, why they're interested in this, they work of course in drug development and with multidisciplinary teams. And so for them, they thought if they had a medium like this where you can see the molecules in 3D quite uh, clearly without having to have special facilities because some people on a flat screen do not see well, etc. then it might help them having uh, meetings where, for instance, the synthetic chemists uh, challenge the models why they should do a certain change and then they can explain it with the structure and so on. And so they really believe in, in virtual reality for this application and that's why they uh, actually uh, uh, assisted us in, in doing these developments. So the other thing that you can then do is you can think, okay, is there anything new you might want to do and you might need to, to these explorations? So one thing you certainly know from, from everyday life uh, is what's called exploded views, right? If you have a technical manual, you often see a, a description of the object by exploding it. Uh, actually, you can apply the same thing also to molecules. So I've been working for some time on ion channels and this is a very schematic view of my favorite ion channel, which is a pentameric one, and so the axis would be here. And so one thing you may want to do is split the subunits uh, across the axis, because a lot of interesting biology goes on at the interfaces between the subunits. Then another thing you might want to do is split, uh, because this is a membrane protein, perpendicular to the membrane, split the transmembrane part from the rest, for instance, or you might combine the two. So schematically, it would look like this. Would, spit it open, and of course you would do it with a molecule. Um, this is concept we implemented in Unity Mall. So here you see in red the symmetry axis, and this is just the first level of splitting, splitting uh, the subunits uh, um, um, going away from the symmetry axis. So why is this interesting? Now, if you think about the virtual reality context, if I look at the molecule from a distance, it's fine. Once I start to stick my head in, of course, rather than bumping the head into the molecule, it could just open up and then it reveals me the interfaces so I can try to understand what's going on here in this uh, packed objects. So this is the type of extensions you can provide. The other thing at some point quite early on that you want to do is be able to share what you're exploring with other people. So uh, Rosa Florianti uh, from the US implemented a sort of shared exploration. Uh, so this here is looking at an enzyme, a nickel iron hydrogenase. And basically trying to retrace the electron transfer pathway that's supposed to going from iron sulfur complex to iron sulfur complex uh, to, to get a tour of these uh, pathways in 3D. Of course, you only see it in flat, so it's not as impressive. But just the idea is that you can pre-record this and then you can share it with your collaborators who can try to go the same 
a, a, a way to understand the systems. And that's basically the first step, I would say, for some collaborative, collaborative approaches. So uh, the next step uh, is really to have some collaboration in 3D. So I would call it a molecular Skype. So this is some example, not with Unity more, but uh, some work from a colleague, Tom Skillman in the US. It's called rpdb.info, and it uses a platform called Allspace VR, which is basically a virtual space that gives you rooms, and you can give a certain flavor to these rooms. So he built a room all about protein structures, and so you can put up a protein in the middle, and then um, any number of people can connect to this room, and everyone gets a little avatar. And so you can see, you can see where people stay, where they look at, and where they point. And in addition, I haven't put on the sound, you can talk naturally like in Skype uh, and understand uh, what's going on. So it's a very nice way to explain to somebody else uh, some features of your favorite protein, for instance. And it's quite uh, useful for interacting and exchanging. So we now have similar features in Unity Mall, but they're not quite uh, stable, so I'm not showing them. Okay, so this was just about looking at structures and deficits. The next thing, of course, is then, or in the lab, we do a lot of molecular dynamic simulations that we like to look at trajectories, or maybe you like to look at data sets, by any chance, some maps or so, possibly. Uh, and so this is an example that we used in a proteomic context, where we have some data on, on a small algae that people work at at the institute. And you can tap into this uh, proteomic data through a database interface. And then you can pull up for any of these proteins in this uh, algae, the 3D structure, and try to make connections between these types of data. So I don't want to talk too much about this, but just uh, to get an idea of the technique. Uh, behind that, you have some database that stores both the experimental data, and it pulls in data from different databases like GenBank, Uniprot, and so on, so that you can have an enriched uh, description of the different prote proteins. And then uh, you have a client that taps into that and that you can access with this headset. And uh, uh, the idea is basically that you have some enriched uh, data mining of these uh, ensembles. So just to give you the scientific context, here it was to understand the, uh, how the redox regulation works of this algae, how it reacts to certain stresses. And um, uh, why I'm, I'm giving this example, because uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about hardware uh, set up. So at the Institute, we have a, not only these headsets, but we also have a display wall. And I'm showing you here the schematic because the room is a bit small and cannot easily take pictures. You can see that the video is not very uh, uh, complete. So that's just to show you the setup. We have this uh, 3D display wall, and we also have a headset in the same room. And so you can switch between these two uh, scenarios because with the headsets, you get a more immersive 3D vision but it's one person at a time, whereas with this um, um, display wall, it can be easily a group of people talking and discussing things, which is very nice in a collaborative setting. And you can actually extend this, this uh, wall and add some um, touch interface to it, and then you can not only point, but also display things and, 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 and annotate them. And the second uh, brief examples I want to give about uh, uh, the data exploration is about electrostatics data. So we had some collaboration with uh, Nathan Baker, who developed the APBS software to calculate uh, uh, electrostatic potentials. And you can basically run the calculations from Unity Mall, and then you can start to explore it. So basically, you can show, for instance, the, the electrostatic field as animated field lines. And so this is a micrococktail multi -rock resistance regulator, and it has a rhodium complex in the inside. And so in a second, it will try to go was the rhodium complex to understand how the uh, field lines go. Unfortunately, because the video is compressed, it's uh, having some trouble of, of reproducing the, 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 the grid views. Sorry about that. But this was still kind of static data that is pre-calculated. You don't change it on the fly. So I think the really interesting uh, step is when you do interactive modeling and when you start to modify things. So we already had this nice talk by Tristan yesterday. So we do similar things, interactive uh, refinement, but we do it at a lower resolution typically. And what we insist on is bringing the human expertise 
in the process because typically these are examples where there's not enough experimental data to have it automatically driven. And so in that case, we also modify the level of uh, representation. These are more coarse-grained uh, computation representations of the objects. And we have applied this to, uh, for instance, modeling the dystrophin filament, which is a very long filament involved in uh, uh, severe uh, uh, pathologies. And we could only get uh, SACS profiles for uh, different fragments of the whole filament and then stitch them together by this interactive approach. Anyway, if you want to know more, more about this, there are, it's, it's published work. And this also, you can use it for teaching, of course. So we have a class where we teach students to unfold and refold RNA and DNA. Uh, uh, typically here you can see they can follow some, some uh, um, value and we do it in the form of a contest. So they try to beat their uh, teammates and that makes them uh, somewhat uh, uh, um, motivated. And this is basically a variant of interactive MD simulations, which we already heard about yesterday. Uh, so this is the same one, but just in virtual reality context. And for some reason, okay. For some reason, the video stopped. Okay, and then you can basically, with this laser pointer metaphor, you can grab an atom and pull on it. And because you have two, you can pull two ends and see what happens, for instance. I mean, in the lab, we are interested in, in mechanical properties, and that's why we look at this. And the very last examples I want to give you, because it's not only molecular dynamics, and you already heard about Capri. So protein-protein uh, docking, for instance, these are two rigid uh, models of proteins. You can try to pull them together. This is Panas and Basta, and you get some feedback about the energies of that, and you get some visual feedback about the interactions. Uh, um, and then you can try to see whether this is useful in this process. This has also been used by the PDP uh, using docking a small ligand to a protein and to use it um, as a fun event to make people aware of, of protein structures. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Fascinating.